Hi, my name is Peter Walls, and I'm here today to tell you a story about a man called Harry Colley, who lived in Dublin a hundred years ago, in an Ireland that was very different from the Ireland we have today. Times were tougher back then, and for most people, just getting enough to eat every day was all they could do. So sit back, relax, and let me tell you a story about one ordinary man, one ordinary foot soldier who surrendered his life to make sure that his dreams of a better world, his dreams of a free and a prosperous Ireland would become a reality for us today. Harry Colley was born in 1891 and until his early 20s, he lived with his mother, his two sisters and an older brother by the name of William on Myrtle Terrace in Dublin's North Docks area. Harry's father had died when he was just a boy, leaving his mother Jane as head of the family. Money was tight, and times were pretty tough, but Harry was hardworking and he was diligent. And at a young age, he managed to secure a job as a cleric, providing a small income that made a great difference to how the family lived. In or about the year 1913, the whole family up and moved to live at number 69 Clonliffe Road, Drumcondra, which was just a stone's throw away from the now famous Croke Park, known then, of course, as Croke Memorial Park. In that very same year, Kerry's football team defeated Wexford in the first ever GAA All-Ireland final to be played there. The GAA, of course, is the Gaelic Athletic Association of Ireland, and it was formed in the late 19th century to promote and preserve everything Irish, and especially national pastimes like Gaelic football and hurling. Croke Park is now, of course, very different from what it was back then, which was little more than a field with just a few proud huts. And in many ways, its success and its exciting path to the extraordinary stadium that it is today not only reflects the passion and the wonder of the story that I'm about to tell you, but its very existence may well have depended on how men and women like Harry Colley stood firmly for what they believed in. Harry was in his early 20s, and like the GAA, was already a deeply passionate man with big dreams. He longed that someday he'd live to see a free and a prosperous Ireland. And to that very end, in 1914, in January 1914 to be precise, he signed up to the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the IRB, at 41 Parnell Square. He joined B Company 1st Battalion, and he later moved to F Company, which was locally known as McDonough's Own. After many long years of waiting, Harry would finally get his chance to rid his country of tyranny and poverty. He trained hard and over the next two years dedicated himself to preparing for the fight, as they called it back then. Now, as you'd imagine, their training attracted a lot of attention, a lot of unwanted attention from the local police force, and there were many nervous clashes. But as tensions grew, the police started to back down. And in 1916, Harry joined his fellow comrades in Dublin for what's now known all over the world as the Easter Rising. He didn't know it then, but within just a few short days, he'd find himself pinned down near the Gresham Hotel by fiercely heavy gunfire, and there'd be little hope of survival. In over 300 years, Ireland has risen up in rebellion no less than eight times. That's almost once every generation. But despite their persistence and their great courage, the rebels were driven back every single time by the sheer might of their much more powerful enemy. This is a true story. It's a story of extraordinary courage in the face of certain death, a story of deep-rooted passion, and the story of the sort of things that that passion will drive us to do. In the early part of the 20th century, despite a generally high standard of living in Dublin, its Catholic population was poverty-stricken, and one in every four women was working the red light district, just to earn enough to feed their children. Dublin had the highest infant mortality rate in Europe, and it had long since lost its place of industrial prominence to the more unionist Belfast. Life in the capital city as an Irish Catholic was little more than one step away from abject poverty or even slavery. Unemployment was commonplace for many, and the soup queues were becoming more prominent every single day. 
you were considered lucky to get a job at all, and for many, the choice was sign up to the British Army or starve. Things were very bad, but as luck would have it, a year later, in 1914, a terrible war broke out in Europe, and thousands of Irish men were forced to fight and to die on foreign soil. Now that must sound terrible. To dare to think that a war where millions would die was a lucky break. But to the Irish freedom fighters, it gave them a chance to make their move, as Britain's attention was elsewhere for a while. Or at least they thought it was. Having a good job put Harry Colley amongst the more fortunate. It meant he wasn't forced by circumstance, like many others, to join the British Army. By early 1916, the crippled and the wounded returning from the so-called Great War in Europe crowded the streets of Dublin. It was an appalling eye-opener and it exposed the true shame and the true horror of war. But again, serendipity was on the side of the Irish freedom fighters. As word spread quickly, it fueled a sleeping passion and the Irish Republican Brotherhood numbers started to swell like never before. Easter 1916 was around the corner Thomas McDonough addressed Harry and his comrades and he indicated clearly that the time for action was at hand. Harry made his peace with his mother as she bid him to go and do his duty and saying goodbye to his sisters, he promised he'd see them all again soon. Irish men and women have risen up and given their lives in vain every single 35 years for centuries. But this time would be different, Harry whispered to himself as he joined his fellow foot soldiers and he marched for Dublin city centre. As I read my grandfather's memoirs about preparing for the fight between 1914 and 1916, I can't help but be struck by the notion that despite having only one practice rifle in their whole regiment, these volunteers fully intended to take on the might of the British Empire and to win. They were in fact sure that they could win. Finally, it's Easter 1916 and the fighting has started. The Irish rebels engage with great passion and with boundless energy. But sadly, within less than four days, four short days, it's all over. The advancing British forces have pushed the rebels right back, relentlessly bombarding their way to the heart of Dublin. Their heavy artillery wreaks havoc as it creates a path of destruction, tearing buildings to the ground and ruthlessly eliminating those that would dare to stand in their way. The might of the British forces is now standing directly outside the GPO, where the Irish leaders and a handful of brave have become cut off and isolated from their comrades. Across the street from the GPO, Harry and his comrades hold the Gresham Hotel, but despite their best efforts, they're eventually driven back by the flames and heavy gunfire. Escaping through the rear exit and out onto the street, Harry, with one of his comrades, finds himself surrounded and trapped. With little chance of survival and less than scant regard for their own safety and welfare, they turn and they face their enemy. Harry leads in charging a blaring British machine gun. He surrenders to his final fate. This ordinary foot soldier gives his life to create a better Ireland for his yet-to-be-born children and for their children's children. Padraig Pearce, chief amongst the rebel leaders, now knows that his days are numbered. He bravely salutes his comrades from within the walls of the GPO, where together they make their final stand. Many, including the great James Connolly, representing the hard-pushed working classes, lie gravely wounded. They've held their position for four days and four nights, and even now, in their final hour and in the face of death itself, they sing songs of praise for their beloved Ireland. Nothing will dampen their passionate spirit. And as Pierce speaks, you could hear a pin drop. During the course of yesterday afternoon and the evening, the enemy succeeded in cutting our communications with our other positions in the city. And we here at headquarters are today isolated. They've burned down whole blocks of houses, apparently with the objective of giving themselves a clear field of play for their artillery. I desire now, lest I not have an opportunity later, to pay homage to your gallantry as soldiers of Irish freedom. 
who have during the past four days been writing with fire and steel the most glorious chapters in the latter history of Ireland. For four days you fought and toiled, almost without cessation, almost without sleep. And in the intervals of fighting, you've sung songs of freedom for Ireland. No man has complained, no man has asked why. You have redeemed Dublin from many shames and you have made her name splendid amongst the names of cities. For my part, as to anything I've done in this, I'm not afraid to face either the judgment of God or the judgment of posterity. Meanwhile, across the street, Harry and his comrades are forced from their stronghold by endless gunfire and by fiercely burning flames as the Gresham Hotel is burnt to the ground. This is the story of an ordinary foot soldier in the face of impossible odds. We spoke to Frank Thornton in Thomas's Lane and we asked him to let us break into the Gresham and take it over, or, or alternatively, let us crawl across O'Connell Street in the shadow of the pillar to our comrades in the GPO. However, we proceeded as I've set out. When some distance up Sean McDermott Street, machine gun fire suddenly opened on us. We took refuge in houses, but found that most of the doors were locked. This was most unusual, as we knew that these were tenement houses where the doors were always open. Apparently, the doors had been closed on orders from the British. A party of us succeeded in getting one open, and we took shelter. After some time, I found myself with only one companion, Flanagan. We could not see what became of our companions, and a search that we made quietly of the houses revealed nothing. Flanagan and I discussed the position in which we found ourselves, and came to the conclusion that if we were captured there, we'd just be put up against the wall and shot. We decided that we'd make a break for it, and even if we had to die that way, it would be preferable. We accordingly set out, I leading, and made a zigzag run up the street. Immediately heavy fire, both machine gun and rifle, opened on us. I came to the conclusion while on that run that I had a charmed life as bullets seemed to be hopping like rain around me. The only one I felt was the one that hit me above the ankle. Suddenly I saw a barricade about 10 yards in front of me with British soldiers firing over it at me. I already had my bayonet fixed. I charged, jumped on the barricade and lunged at the soldier on the other side. As I did, I fell on the barricade and found that I was not able to rise. I had been wounded, but did not know it until I had occasion to put effort into it. The soldier had also lunged at me with his bayonet and had got me in the side as I was falling. I then began to feel pain all over and I was moaning. Suddenly the old spirit reasserted itself and I decided I was not going to let these British soldiers hear me moaning. I suppressed it. Shortly afterwards he caught me by the back of the collar and pulled me up to the top of the barricade. Apparently, others of our men were making the same effort, and the British were still firing at them. The soldier put the rifle across my back, taking cover behind me, and kept on firing for some time. I will say in fairness to him that I think he thought I was dead. I was now absolutely helpless, and I found I was unable to move whatsoever. Some few minutes later, he again caught me by the back of the neck, and pulled me over to his side of the barricade and let me fall. My head stuck in the back of a chair which formed part of the barricade and my body fell over. I thought my neck was broken. I must have gone unconscious at this period for the next I knew there were some RAMC men carrying flashlights and a stretcher. A corporal of the RAMC was stooping over me and he raised himself and said, take him gently boys. He appears to be very badly hurt. I shall always remember the humane and Christian attitude of that RAMC corporal. Against all odds, 
Harry Colley survives his machine gun charge and he lives to tell the tale. He'd taken six bullets, had been pierced by the blade of a bayonet and every one of his major organs was seriously damaged, beyond repair, they said. He was administered extra unction and, there were, and he was told three times that he was dying, but he defied the doctors and the nurses and he simply would not slip away. Harry went on to spend some time in a British jail, being released on a prisoner of war exchange pact in 1917. And for the next four years, he fought bravely and courageously against the occupying forces until finally they withdrew in 1921. Under a treaty that was in itself a great victory but tasted bittersweet as it left six of Ireland's great counties still under British rule. Many years later, Harry Colley was elected to Doyle Eyre in the Irish Parliament. And in his senior years, he served as an Irish senator. His son, George Colley, also entered politics, eventually rising to become the country's 10th Deputy Prime Minister, or Thánaiste, if you say it in Gaelic. Harry has two sons and six daughters, one of whom was Claire Colley, my mother. In his final days, they say Harry fought many imaginary battles along the corridors of the hospital, where in 1972, at the ripe old age of 81, or just short of 81, he would finally, peacefully, slip away. They say the pen is even mightier than the sword. So let me end my story with a verse from the great Bobby Sands, who died in hunger strike many decades later, fighting again for the freedom of oppressed souls everywhere. The Rhythm of Time by Bobby Sands. There's an inner thing in every man. Do you know this thing, my friend? It has withstood the blows of a million years and it will do so to the end. It was born when time did not exist and it grew up out of life. It cut down evil's strangling vines like a slashing, searing knife. It lit fires when fires were not and burnt the mind of man, tempering leaden hearts to steel from the time that time began. It wept by the waters of Babylon, and when all men were a loss, it screeched in writhing agony, and it hung bleeding from the cross. It died in Rome by lion and sword, and in defiant, cruel array, when the deathly word was Spartacus along the Appian Way. It marched with Watt the Tyler's poor, and frightened lord and king, and it was emblazoned in their deathly stare as e'er a living thing. It smiled in holy innocence before conquistadors of old, so meek and tame and unaware of the deathly power of gold. It burst forth through pitiful Paris streets and stormed the old Bastille and marched upon the serpent's head and crushed it neath its heel. It died in blood on buffalo plains and starved by moons of rain. Its heart was buried at wounded knee, but it came to rise again. It screamed aloud by Kerry Lakes as it was knelt upon the ground and it died in great defiance as they coldly shot it down. It's found in every light of hope. It knows no bounds nor space. It has risen in red and black and white. It's there in every race. It lies in the hearts of heroes dead. It screams in tyrant's eyes. It has reached the peaks of mountains high. It comes searing across the skies. It lights the dark of this prison cell. It thunders forth its might. It is the undauntable thought, my friend, that thought that says, I'm right.